Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. I'm Chili'i Akina, President and CEO of the Institute. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Our topic is Democracy in Peril, Upholding Government Transparency During a Time of Crisis. We've got some outstanding guests joining us today on the panel, Brian Black and Sandy Ma, and I'll be introducing them in just a moment. At the Grassroot Institute, we're committed to the preservation of individual liberty, economic freedom, and limited and accountable government. And that's why we're delighted to work with other organizations toward these ends. But first, let me say this. We want your participation today, and we thank you for being with us. There are over 180 of us registered for this webinar right now, and it's also being live streamed on Facebook. You'll be able to send it around later on because we'll post on our website a copy of everything that has taken place today. But in the meantime, would you get ready for your questions? At any point, you can jot them down online, and Joe Kent later on will moderate and field your questions to our panelists. Let me get started. Hawaii's Governor David Ige used his emergency powers in March to declare a statewide lockdown of Hawaii's economy and social fabric. And this was in response to the coronavirus crisis. He also suspended the state's generally excellent open meetings and open records laws, leaving Hawaii citizens in the dark about the proceedings of government. Now, this raises many questions, and perhaps you've asked them. Was it really necessary to suspend the state's sunshine law concerning open meetings and the Uniform Information Practice Act concerning open records, all in the name of fighting the coronavirus? And what can be done now at this point to restore government transparency and accountability here in Hawaii? To discuss these questions, I've invited today Brian Black and Sandy Ma to join me. Let me introduce them to you now. Brian Black is the executive director of the Civil Beat Law Center for the Public Interest. The center is committed to promoting transparency and responsiveness in government, believing that secrecy fuels distrust of public officials. Brian is a graduate of Harvard University and Cornell Law School. He clerked for the Federal District Court in Connecticut. He completed a fellowship at New York University, and he was in practice at the law firm of Hogan Lovells in New York City. When he returned to Hawaii, Brian left practice, private practice to join the city and county before taking his current position with Civil Beat Law Center. Sandy Ma is the executive director of Common Cause Hawaii. Common Cause is dedicated to strengthening public participation in government, curbing the influence of money in politics, ensuring that government serves the common good rather than special interests, and promoting fair, honest, and modern elections. Sandy previously was an ACLU attorney in North Carolina and Hawaii. She was a private practice attorney for a number of years. She most recently worked with the Hawaii Office of Planning and Coastal Zone Management Program, focusing on climate change, sea level rise, and coastal hazard issues. Sandy has a BA from Johns Hopkins University, a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law, and an LLM in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School. So in just a moment, we'll dive into our topic, but first let me say hello. Brian, thank you for joining us today. Hello to you, and Sandy, hello to you. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks thank for you. having me, Pui. Well, and thank you. We have been talking about the recent suspension of government transparency here in Hawaii to fight the coronavirus. Our panelists will discuss three questions. Number one, what's gone wrong? in terms of transparency. Number two, how do we fix it? And number three, why does it matter? To open us up in terms of talking about what went wrong, I invite Brian Black to join us now for the next eight minutes. Brian, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so in terms of just really quickly terminology, um, because I may throw around different terms that are synonymous. Uh, first, when, it, when we're talking about public records law, um, I may, we're talking about the Uniform Information Practices Act, I may use the term UEPA, which is the acronym sort of sounded out. And when we're talking about open meetings, uh, so government meetings like say uh, the Board of Land and Natural Resources uh, having to do things in public, uh, I may use the term sunshine law, which is the, the short form for, for that particular law. So on March 16th, as uh, Kaylee mentioned, uh, Governor Ige, issued a supplemental proclamation that 
suspended the those laws. Now there's some debate as to uh, there there could have been some debate as to what exactly the proclamation did and the extent to which it suspended those laws. Uh, but in the end, uh, the following week on March 23rd, the Office of Information Practices, which is the office that interprets both UEPA and the Sunshine Law, issued guidance. And in that guidance they made very clear that those laws essentially don't apply, period, across the board uh, during this period of emergency. So they had interpreted the, the governor's proclamation to be such that uh, requirements for notice uh, of meetings, when you talk about open meetings, requirements for public testimony, uh, those simply don't apply. And uh, any indication that agencies needed to respond to or consider public records requests don't apply during this period. So at that point, the Law Center started to look at what other states were doing. And uh, what we found was, of course, in the COVID scenario that we're in right now, most states were doing something because the idea of open meetings uh, or public records is a little different, but the idea of open meetings during a period when you're supposed to have social distancing and uh, stay at home orders and things like that, it doesn't make sense uh, in the same way. So how do you accomplish that? Uh, and states, one thing to keep in mind is that each state is its own sort of uh, beast when it comes to public records and open meetings. And they all kind of do things a little bit differently. There's, there's some similarities, but they're all a little different. But most of the states were doing things a little bit differently, uh, both as it concerned public records and open meetings. No state, however, had done something as extreme as what OIP interpreted the supplemental proclamation to be. So you weren't seeing any states that were just saying, uh, there's no such thing as a public records law. There's no such thing as an open meetings law during this period and leaving it to sort of a wild west of whatever it is that the boards and agencies decided that they were going to do. So assuming that OIP had correctly interpreted it, and at this point it didn't really matter because the agencies, uh, regardless of whatever the proclamation may say, because OIP is the, is the board or the agency that is charged with interpreting these laws, government uh, was looking to OIP for how to interpret them. And so they were gonna rely on whatever it is that OIP said anyway, regardless of uh, how you might look at the proclamation. So assuming that OIP interpreted the proclamation correctly, the Law Center sent Governor Ige a letter on March 26th that pointed out the issues with respect to how other jurisdictions were interpreting the law, um, or, or interpreting the emergency scenario that we were in, and uh, calling for there to be some reinstatement of some kind. Uh, a few days later, Common Cause had organized a coalition of uh, organizations to send a similar letter, uh, although, although much nicer. <laughs> this letter was much nicer. Um, that called for the governor to, to sort of fix this, fix this scenario. Uh, meanwhile, what we're seeing is that there's a broad range of the way that boards and agencies are responding to the situation. There are some who are making the effort to continue to have public access, and there are others who are not. Um, right now, there are discussions that are ongoing regarding how we can put uh, with, with the AG's office regarding how to put forward minimum procedures so that we have something that is uh, open access principles during this emergency period. So that's the broad overview of what went wrong uh, and, a, and hopefully some directions that we're headed in. Okay, well, it looks like uh, Kay Lee might be having some trouble uh, with his microphone or video. Um, and uh, I would ask him if he's having trouble, but I can't see him. So I'll bet you he'll come. Oh, there he is. There he is. Uh, Kay Lee, if you're talking, we can't hear you. 
good. Okay, are we there on? Yeah, yeah. Very go good. Ahead. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for that presentation, and we look forward to asking you some questions late, later on. But I've got one for you just now. You said that the position that Hawaii has taken is the most extreme of any in the 50 states in terms of rescinding transparency laws during the coronavirus crisis. What was our government trying to accomplish by doing such? And do you think we are accomplishing that goal? So I, I think there's, there's two things to distinguish here. I think, I think one is, uh, was, was a full suspension and the extreme interpretation exactly what everyone in government intended? I, I'm not positive about that. I'm not sure that that's what Governor Ige necessarily intended with his proclamation. Um, but to the extent that there was a concern about rolling things back, and there are concerns in other jurisdictions about rolling things back with respect to public access, a lot of it has to do with the availability of resources when you have government employees who are um, staying at home, when you have government employees who are uh, responding to the COVID emergency. And so um, when they are focused or idle, either one of those, uh, and you don't have the same resources that are normally available in terms of being able to answer public records requests or to coordinate meetings in a completely new environment, then how do you, um, you they, they were looking for some more flexibility. Um, and so I think that's what the, if you want to take a step back and just look at the overall intent of the proclamation, I think it was looking for more flexibility because of the uncertainty. Uh, and again, whether or not it was uh, intended to go as far as uh, it had been interpreted is, is, an, is, is a debatable question. Well, that's certainly, Brian, if you don't mind my saying, a, a generous interpretation that, that you're giving to the actions of the state. And we hope that they are as benign as that. But nonetheless, it leaves room for the public to be left in the dark, and there are some negative consequences that could occur. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I think that it's, it's definitely a situation that is not good, and I think it sets a bad precedent for any future situations that may be similar to this, that we have sort of <laughs> stepped off of a cliff and set this idea that this is how we are going to respond when we need flexibility. And that's, that's why I think there needs to be um, some sort of measured response uh, to show a, as much as possible if we can show how it should have been um, and, and get, to, get us to a scenario where we can reset that precedent so that if something like this happens in the future, we know how government should respond to these types of emergencies. Um, knowing that they may need flexibility, that, that, that may be a, a concern, how does that look uh, if done properly, as opposed to this idea that has been now seems to be the, the standard, which is it's all fair game, it's all thrown well. Well, thank you, Brian. And I'm going to go to Sandy now. Sandy, I appreciate the fact that Common Cause, under your leadership, headed up a movement to coalesce several organizations to write a letter to the governor. And we we're glad that Grassroot Institute was able to participate in that with you. And in that letter, you address some of the concerns Brian raises, particularly the resource issue. For example, how in the world can we accomplish transparency uh, when people can't meet in person? Do we have the technology and can technology be used? I'll hand over to you now as you answer the question, what can be done at this time? Sandy Ma, thank you. Thank you, um, Grassroot Institute and Kaylee for having Common Cause Hawaii participate in this webinar. As both you and Brian have uh, discussed, uh, Common Cause Hawaii and a coalition of about 40 plus um, organizations and individuals sent a letter to governor and other uh, elected leaders across the state, uh, legislators and um, uh, mayors and county council members uh, letting them know that even though the Sunshine Law and open meetings records um, was suspended, the laws were suspended by uh, governor's um, emergency proclamation on March 16th, government is still meeting, uh, boards and commissions are still meeting, but uh, 
um, we still have the um, ability to uh, participate in um, government meetings. And so we had put forth a list of um, best practices, um, national common cause and supported by local common cause, a list of best practices for governments to meet, uh, government boards and agencies. And so one of them is that we should postpone a uh, routine non-priority government uh, action until the state of emergency has passed. Uh, for example, uh, the State Campaign Spending Commission had postponed its uh, April uh, meeting until May. Um, when a, a board continues to meet, they should have notice be published, and it should be published widely. Uh, the State Ethics uh, Commission and the Honolulu Ethics Commission uh, did publish notice of its meeting, and so that's really good for us uh, to know. Um, and that if a board does meet, that uh, it should be having video conferences and audio conferences for people who do not have broadband access or people who do not have computers so that people can participate remotely. Um, and also when people participate remotely, when the public participates remotely, it should be so that the people could call in, should be able to remotely testify. Um, there have been meetings in which uh, the people are allowed to submit written testimony in advance. Writing uh, testimony in advance isn't sufficient. This is not a real public participation uh, in a meeting. And this is because as people who uh, are civically engaged uh, know, uh, when board members are um, talk amongst themselves at a uh, public meeting, your testimony changes. And that's why uh, real-time remote, uh, remote testimony is really uh, necessary. Um, there have been lots of, um, I will say lots of government meetings that have been going on uh, that have not allowed for um, real-time remote uh, testimony. For example, the Honolulu um, Salary Commission just met recently and it uh, said that uh, you could submit your testimony but did not allow for real-time um, remote testimony. And, and it also didn't uh, live stream any of the meetings. You had to go in person, which is uh, kind of crazy in this uh, uh, public health crisis when people are under a stay-at-home, work-from-home uh, order. We've also provided that uh, um, at the start of a meeting um, that people should announce the names of people who are uh, board members who are participating uh, in the meeting and that votes should be conducted by roll call um, so that people are know, uh, who are monitoring the meeting should know how meetings are, votes are occurring at the meeting. And we've also asked that the um, documents that are being used at any public uh, meeting should be posted uh, uh, online so that people can access those materials. Uh, that's vitally important. Uh, for example, there is a Honolulu Zoning Committee meeting uh, coming up on Thursday, and those uh, materials of the Honolulu uh, Zoning um, Committee are not going to be posted remotely. You have to actually go in person to Honolulu Hale to access those uh, Zoning uh, Committee uh, materials. And uh, even though the Honolulu Zoning Committee will be live streaming its meeting, uh, it will not be allowing for remote testimony. You have to go in person to testify. You could submit your testimony in advance, but what good is your testimony submitted in advance if you can't actually review the materials unless you go in person? So there are, um, it's, it's a, a very interesting time and um, lots can be improved with the remote access and uh, government sunshine meetings uh, that's uh, occurring. We've also asked that uh, if a board enters into executive session. It is announced that uh, no one else is present uh, during executive session or that other people could hear them. We've also asked uh, that uh, the public uh, meetings are recorded and put up online so that people can review the um, recorded meetings. And those are some of our best practices that we've uh, requested that uh, boards and commissions uh, adhere to and we've made that request in our letter uh, to Governor Ige. So um, that is uh, what was included in our letter. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, 
take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. I appreciate that presentation. And we will have the audience give you some questions in a short while. But I wanted to ask you this for now. Your, your presupposition is that there is sufficient technology and sufficient security with that technology to facilitate public participation in online meetings. But there are some critics who've raised some doubt about that. The governor himself at one point said that there were problems with the very platform that we happen to be using today, Zoom. And I wonder if you had any response to this. There's a lot of different uh, remote technologies available. I mean, the very basic one is a phone call. Um, I participated in a phone meeting with the Honolulu State Ethics Commission um, at the very end of March, and that worked fine. Uh, we all announced ourselves. <laughs> um, so uh, there are people in Hawaii who do, do not have broadband access and who, people who even choose not to have a computer uh, so we could always use a phone uh, for people who uh, complain about Zoom bombing or who have had their meetings uh, bombed by Zoom. Uh, there is Cisco WebEx, there is Blue Jeans, the um, Maui County Council and Maui uh, uh, County Council committee meetings use uh, Blue Jeans. Uh, there are lots of different uh, uh, platforms to use. I, I'm sure Brian has some uh, comments too about that. All right, well, thank you very much, Sandy. We'll be back with you in just a moment. And to the audience, I, I want to thank Brian and Sandy for their very excellent presentations on the loss of government transparency during this time of response to the coronavirus crisis. And they've addressed basically what's gone wrong here in the state of Hawaii with respect to transparency and what we can do to fix that. What I'd like to do for a short period is give you some comments on why it matters. Why is transparency and accountability in government important? The principle of transparency is not a new idea at all. It's not novel. Philosophically, you can find its roots in the Enlightenment as the idea called the consent of the government. In fact, the whole concept of the social contract implies some level of government transparency. I like what John Adams said about this. Liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among people who have a right and a desire to know. That is knowledge amongst the people who have a right and a desire to know. In short, transparency, which is public access to information and the workings of the government, is a safeguard against corruption, backroom deals, questionable accounting, and other ills. It's a check on fraud, waste, and abuse. Transparency is also a tool that helps citizens to trust their government, which is so very important. And it's also a tool that helps citizens to know that the government is taking rational actions. For example, what's the rationale for a property tax hike? I mean, how is the money currently being spent? Is it wasteful? Is it clear that the department that will benefit from the tax hike actually has a need of that funding? Transparency is what answers these questions and many others that the citizenry has a right and a responsibility to ask. And you can't be an informed voter or citizen without transparency. So why does transparency matter now? Why do we object to the governor's suspension of sunshine and open records laws during the lockdown? The answer is very basic. If transparency is critical at all times, it doesn't become less during an emergency. If anything, it becomes more important, especially during a time in which decisions are made being very, made very hastily. We're seeing decisions that have substantial effects on our civil liberties and our economy. Every day, there are new announcements about regulations that have just cropped up. Access to the process by which these decisions are made is essential to secure public trust and cooperation. Now, I wanna explain something. Uh, by raising these objections, it doesn't mean that we don't recognize a place for compromise in light of the health and safety issues that have to be addressed by government. And, and that's why we're joining Common Cause in making recommendations to preserve open meetings by using technology or by extending the deadline for record requests. In closing, I'd like to remind you of something that was said by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in an article he wrote in 1913 in Harper's Bazaar, a very popular magazine at that time. 
Justice Brandeis summarized the basic philosophy behind transparency with the following words. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfections, infectants. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. And that's probably the greatest reason to have transparency and openness. With that, I'd like to invite you all to answer, ask your questions at this time. Uh, Sandy and Brian are standing by, but before that, make sure that you use the tool that's on your um, screen right now to submit a question and we'll be sure to get to it. Next week, by the way, April 30th at noon, we have another webinar entitled, Is Hawaii Taxing Healthcare to Death? Hawaii's struggling healthcare industry is being taxed and a group of doctors believe it's dying because of this. And they'll discuss that. Our event will feature local medical doctors, Scott Grosskreutz, Elizabeth Ignacio, and Ed Goodling. And along with them, we'll have economist and grassroots scholar John Dunham, PhD, who authored our grassroots report entitled, How Hawaii's GET Adds to Island Healthcare Costs. And you can find that on our website. So to sign up for next week's webinar, join us April 30th at noon. You can do that on our website. Is Hawaii taxing healthcare to death? With that said, Sandy and Brian, we're ready to give you some questions and I'm going to invite uh, Joe Kent, our Executive Vice President, to lead us during this time. Sure, well, we're getting a lot of great questions rolling in and keep them coming. One from Caroline Kim asks, uh, Common Cause, uh, one of the things that Executive Session covers is personnel issues. And which is why boards often go into executive session. So she asked, why are you advising that the public can hear and listen in on such sessions? Oh, um, hi, Carolyn, thank you for the question. Sorry uh, if I um, misspoke or there was some confusion. Uh, that wasn't the intent. It's not that the public should be able to listen in on executive session. It's just that prior, in, prior to entering into executive session, it should be announced that no one else is there listening into executive session or no one is present in the executive session meetings. So that it is truly an executive session and it's not a, a um, opportunity uh, to talk about things that should not be discussed in executive session. Good. Um, Dwayne Lopez asks, how does this transparency blackout affect the current legislature bills that were in motion this session? Um, the, the legislature is uh, suspended at indefinitely recessed at this time. So um, no bills are moving right now. It was recessed, I believe, on March uh, 16th. Uh, I think that was the date it was recessed. But legislative offices are open. So if you need to talk with your individual legislator, please call them, email them, they are available. It's my understanding that individual offices are open. Um, um, their physical office uh, at, the legislator, at the legislature is closed, but you can still talk to them, contact them, reach out to them. Another um, question from Dwayne, he asks, when the transparency blackout ends, how can an accounting of activities like law or rule changes or contracts ex executed and all that, um, how can that be known if we don't have transparency? Uh, so I'll, I'll take that one. The, um, the, how can, how can it be known? So the idea is that we're, we're trying to move toward a situation where there is some transparency during this period. But if, uh, let's say if the current uh, situation were to continue throughout, um, as far as the public records law goes, uh, you could make a request after the suspension is lifted and it would follow its normal course. The one concern that I, I think folks have raised about that particular scenario is the fact that um, for when the laws are in place, the, the asking of a request, like putting a request forward, usually will suspend uh, the destruction of the records. So if you are in a situation where the laws don't apply, 
and a request is made uh, the, that provision that would keep people uh, from destroying records while there is a pending request doesn't necessarily apply. And that leads to concerns that records may be lost during this period. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that uh, we're trying to directly address uh, in, in this period where we're, we're talking about things that should be in place just to, for bare protection of, of the public's interests. Another question uh, from Gerald Cato. He asks, how long can the governor suspend open government or other laws under emergency powers? So the emergency powers provisions, uh, they, they work in terms of 60 day periods, uh, but they can be continued. So if you look at, for example, what the governor did with uh, the homeless uh, emergency proclamations that he had done, I don't remember how long ago that was, it was like maybe a year and a half ago or so. Um, he, part of that was suspending the uh, Sunshine Law as it pertained to trying to get things done with, uh, in addressing the homeless crisis. So that continued for a long period of time. I don't think it had any practical effect in the end because uh, the Sunshine Law really wasn't impeding response to the homeless uh, crisis, but uh, it continued for a long period of time. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a question of how long, it's a question of how long the emergency, how long can he do it for these particular laws? It's a question of how long the emergency is. I see. Um, Donna Wong asks, are Oahu neighborhood boards considered boards that would fall under Governor Ige's exemptions? Yes. Yes, they are. They've, they've been, um, for sunshine law purposes and- yeah. And sunshine. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, sunshine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, Nancy Cook Lauer asks, so Brian, are you saying it's best to wait before filing a open records request so they don't destroy them? <laughs> <laughs> I, so um, I think it's, I, I think there's a potential risk, but in the end, it, uh, I, what I tell folks is it depends on your uh, the, the agency you're making the request to. So I think there are some agencies that are trying to do the right thing. And um, for Nancy, for example, I, I suspect that most of the Big Island agencies are trying to do the right thing. Uh, I think the state agencies are trying to do the right thing. Um, but uh, hopefully for those that may not be in the right mindset, uh, there will be some relief uh, at some point, the governor can will clarify um, the minimum requirements. That's what that's what I'm hoping. I have a question. I hope you don't mind me me asking. I'm I'm wondering. There's a lot of. I think the governor said that um, you know a lot of groups are doing the right thing. And but how do we know which groups are doing the right thing if there isn't transparency? No, I, mean, I, I think that's completely right. I, you know, there's. The idea of trust me on the government only goes so far, right? Um, and it has a lot to do at, at this point with, uh, you know, some people have relationships that they have a better understanding of who they're working with. Uh, but, you know, most people don't. And, you know, most people, I think, uh, would be legitimately concerned that there are uh, there's the risk of documents being lost. There's a risk that, board, uh, that boards and commissions are meeting um, behind closed doors and not letting people know because they can. Um, so I think uh, th there are these uh, legitimate risks and I think that's why it's important for there to be a, uh, like as I said, a, a precedent that works for everyone to feel like there is the bare minimum in place to alleviate that, those anxieties, to, to provide some assurance that we're setting the right tone, that people need to be um, in the right mindset, that they are going to uh, behave in a way that uh, respects public access. 
Mark Hagedon asks um, a question to Brian. When you say it depends on how long the emergency lasts, then how is that signaled? Um, what defines the end of the emergency um, to the point where go the governor could use that as an excuse to waive transparency? I mean, in the end, if if someone were to if, if someone were to push this in terms of a lawsuit or an attack, uh, there are potential ways to do it, um, but there is a lot of discretion for the governor within the emergency powers statute to decide when an emergency ends and to um, decide what the scope of the necessary response is to it. So I'm, I'm not sure that <laughs> not sure that a lawsuit or a, you know a challenge to his authority to do that is probably the most productive way. So thinking about it in terms of uh, you know how would you attack his his authority is is probably counterproductive. It's more to um, think about it in terms of how can we get to a point where we're all a, a little bit less nervous. Jonathan Durrett asks Sandy, is there a state that we can hold up as a model in this transparency of records area? You know, um, that's a great question and I don't know of one. We're all just kind of feeling our way through it because different states are open to a different degree. Some legislatures are still meeting and they're more open than ours. And so um, while so, uh, it, so different states are, are, are more open uh, than us just because they're more, more open and, and, and they're meeting. Uh, legis other legislator, legislatures are still, are, are still working, um, passing bills, uh, and, so, uh, and their government is more uh, functioning, uh, even though ours is functioning, is, is working, but there's it's just is more, um, is more open. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, questions. There's a lot of similar questions about that people are asking about what can we do? How can we fix it? Uh, what venues can we use to voice our concerns? Is the best way a legal avenue or just persuasion or um, how do we fix it? You know, that's a that's another great question. I have been, uh, I've through Common Cause, we've written like six or seven letters to different boards and commissions that have been meeting, uh, county council uh, committees that have been meeting, letting them know that uh, not allowing for real-time testimony is not uh, proper, uh, that's not real uh, public participation, not providing um, online uh, materials uh, is not proper. Um, so, I mean, just, being aware of what is uh, meeting, what agencies are meeting is really important. And then uh, letting uh, your elected officials, letting government uh, uh, agencies and boards know what you expect of them. Um, just because Sunshine Law may have been suspended doesn't mean that they can't do the right thing and they shouldn't do the right thing. There's technology out there. At, at the very minimum, there's a phone. Use the phone. Um, and so it, it is possible. Um, if you guys want any of our letters, I'm happy to share them, uh, you know, um, so yeah, just, just knowing, uh, being aware. Um, okay. Dwayne Lopez asks, conversely, from the governor's point of view, um, how does a blackout of transparency aid his emergency actions? So like, like I mentioned before, I think the, um, it, it's, a uh, the taking a step back, right? Like going back to mid March when this was entered and not knowing, uh, I think that was even before stay at home and all that, not knowing where things were going to go, but knowing probably that there was going to be some more extreme steps that needed to be taken. The concern I, I have heard voiced is that they needed some flexibility. Um, in terms of not knowing, in terms of the uncertainty they had as to where things were going to go. Now, as, as I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm not sure that Governor 
the intent of the proclamations is as far as what it was in subsequently interpreted it to be. But, um, but the idea in general was that uh, there's a possibility that you wouldn't have people who were available, uh, staff, employees, government employees, available to do the things that they previously had done in terms of responding to records requests or, um, you know, and the open meetings is a completely different world, right? Like you have to learn the, whatever the technology is and be able to implement it. So uh, I, I think those uncertainties were such that uh, the thought process behind the, the proclamations as, as far as, uh, you know, I have an understanding of it was the need for a little bit more flexibility. Okay, well, um, that's the, the most of the questions uh, we, we have answered uh, actually um, in the audience, but I have a question, which is um, for the people, Sandy, who signed your letter, uh, it seemed like there were more than, I don't know, 10 or 20 groups or maybe 30 groups out there that signed it. What are they saying? And, um, you know, and who were some of those groups? We had about 40 uh, plus groups and individuals who signed um, signed on to the letter uh, that was submitted March 31st, like I said, to the governor, to all legislators, um, to the mayors, and um, to, uh, let's see, um, and council members. And so uh, here are a sample of some organizations, ACLU of Hawaii, um, of course, your organization, Grassroots Institute of Hawaii, um, Civil Beat Law Center for the public interest, say that out loud, <laughs> all of it. Um, uh, Community Alliance on Prison, um, let's see, Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice, uh, some individuals, uh, let's see, uh, Lance Collins, we had uh, thousand friend, Hawaii's Thousand Friends, um, Hawaii Community Lending, Libertarian Party, uh, LGBT Caucus, Democratic Party, we have Media Council of Hawaii, Ryan Ozawa, um, Transform Hawaii Government, uh, West Maui Preservation Association. Um, so it's a broad section of, um, of groups. And so people are concerned of this lack of transparency, um, just this lack of uh, understanding of how government going about conducting business in this time of public health crisis and not being um, cognizant of how this affects the public um, and how uh, public um, is feeling kind of, um, you know, being at home and not knowing what's going on with what government is doing. And this just uh, creates more anxiety uh, for, for us and just needing to be part of what our government is doing, just feeling connected and being um, uh, in tune with what's going on and, and feeling like we have a hand in, in our and controlling our lives in, in a little bit and, and helping out mm -hmm. and you know having some input. And that's really what this is about, you know, not government just going off and saying, we're just gonna do this without your input because government is really, um, elected by us and should be responsible and responsive to us is what I say. And government just goes off and runs off telling us what to do without any input from us. That, that's not our government. That is not few, our government. We have a government. few other questions here too. Um, Tim Means says, has there been any response to your letters or have they just ignored them? Oh yeah, sorry about that. Yes, that's a big part. We did get a letter back from uh, Governor Ige and it was um, a nice letter, uh, but it really said, you know, hey, we're doing the right thing. Don't worry about it. Um, and the boards or commissions are continuing to meet. Um, and, but that's the problem. It's the fact that they are continuing to meet. And how do we know this if there's not a, a sunshine law that they're supposed to follow and that they're not, and they're supposed to post notice that we can know about that they're meeting and that we could participate in. Um, and that we could give public input and public comment and participate in real time. And so that was the uh, whole um, disconnect with, uh, with our government, that they are continuing to meet and that we don't know about what they're meeting about and letting us participate. 
and we should know about them. They should understand our fears and our concerns and we should be able to guide them in some sense. We understand that they have to uh, move fast. We're in a pandemic. Um, we shouldn't be bogged down in minutia, but they should also know what our concerns are. Mm -hmm. so, Ed, Ed Hanel asks, given the governor's need for flexibility, why can't he provide what factors will influence his decision to end the suspension of the Sunshine Laws? I, I think he has indicated um, that there's that the suspension of the public access laws was intended to be temporary, um, and I, I, there are ongoing conversations about trying to, as I said, put in place some minimum procedures that will I. I I think helped to alleviate a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the concerns that have been voiced. Um, so I, you know, uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree that it would be helpful to know what he's thinking, but um, even if there weren't public access laws, he wouldn't have to articulate that. <laughs> uh, even if the public access laws were in effect, he wouldn't have to articulate that. So. Um, just to dovetail on that a bit, uh, my understanding is that open records and open meeting laws generally pertain to deliberative bodies, bodies we have to watch and carrying out their, their, their functions. But doesn't the governor have executive powers and emergency powers that can be used and wouldn't those equip him to deal with most of the issues he would need to deal with in a time of crisis? Yes, I, I actually the the public records law isn't limited to the the boards and commissions or the deliberative discussion part of it. So the public records law applies across the board to all government agencies. Um, and uh, the idea of the emergency powers statute is is as you're saying, like he he would have the authority to address most of his concerns um, through the powers that are granted by that statute. I don't know if that. So that raises again the question we addressed earlier: Why? You know, what 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 goal is there in the suspension of many of the features of Chapter Ninety Two? Uh, what was the, the aim of all of this. I know, Brian, you mentioned flexibility that, that does give broad flexibility, but uh, just practically, how necessary was it? And I think that's a, an open question we probably are gonna leave today. Joe, do we have any other questions yeah. before we close up? A couple more. We'll Malia, more. Malia Hill. Um, the policy director at Grassroot Institute is watching and she asks, when the emergency is over, what kind of changes can we propose in the law to protect Hawaii's transparency laws from another such blanket suspension in the future? Great question. Yeah, d definitely a really good question. I, I think the, um, as I said, I, I, I think trying to set the right precedent um, and, 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 and reform this precedent that has been set of the idea that you can you just exempt uh, you just throw out both laws and that's it um, and and trying to set up a minimum standards that that's one way to address it so that we can at least point to something in the future if this comes up it, the difficulty with the um, with the way the emergency powers statute is written is it provides for pretty broad authority I suppose the legislature could, um, but I, I, they, they could limit that authority in some respects by statute maybe, but then again, his authority under the constitution it may not make a difference. Um, the only way you could for sure make sure that this, something like this didn't happen again would be to have a constitutional amendment. Um, something that puts into place uh, something clear as far as what the bare minimum is for public access. Sounds like a great con amp. <laughs> Joe, any more questions? Um, the, the last question here that pertains to this is um, basically 
someone's just voicing uh, concern. She says, a lot of groups believe that when the Capitol, under the guise of protecting each other from the spreading coronavirus, most were accepting. And now we're realizing we've lost our voices and rights. So there, it, it does seem that there's a lot of um, people who are kind of saying things like that. Uh, Mark Coleman asks, Brian, you said something about an emergency statute. Can that be amended to restrict the capriciousness of future emergency proclamations? Is that a constitutional amendment as you just mentioned? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I mean, it, it's uh, either one of those would have to go through the legislature, uh, whether it's a con -am or a or a statutory amendment. Um, and I, I'm not even sure that a statutory amendment to that emergency powers law would necessarily limit um, the governor's constitutional um, yeah, public, uh, public order, uh, ability to control public order. So it, it's, it would at least provide guidance if it were statutory, um, but a con -am would definitely be the, the way to ensure that this didn't happen in the future. Very good. Joe, thank you for moderating the Q&A period. That's Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of Grasser Institute. Any parting thought or farewell from you, Brian, and then from Sandy? No, I, I, I didn't have anything further to add. Thank you, Katie. Well, Brian, thank you very much. And thanks for your ongoing work at the Civil Beat Law Center. Sandy? No, thank you. Thank you for having us. And uh, thank you for holding this session. And thanks for coordinating the coalition of those who responded to the governor, Sandy, through Common Cause. We appreciate it. Well, everyone, we appreciate you joining us today at the Grassroot Institute webinar. We'll see you next week on the 20th. Just go to our website to sign up. Until then, aloha, and thank you for being here today.